This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Hungary's broken with the European Union and announced it's prepared to start paying for Russian gas and rubles. Hungary's right-wing nationalist leader, Viktor Orban, made the announcement Wednesday, just days after he was re-elected to a fourth consecutive term as prime minister. We have no problem paying for gas in rubles. If Russia asks for this, we will pay in rubles. Orban is widely viewed as Vladimir Putin's closest ally in Europe. He's refused to join other NATO nations in sending arms to Ukraine, but he has also condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. During a conversation Wednesday, Orban reportedly urged Putin to implement an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine and offered to host talks in Budapest. Ukraine, which shares an 85-mile border with Hungary, criticized Orban's ties to Putin. The Ukrainian foreign ministry issued a statement saying, quote, apparently, after the elections, Budapest moved on to the next step, helping Putin continue his aggression against Ukraine, unquote. While Orban has been widely criticized for cracking down on press freedom and promoting anti-immigrant policies, he's been embraced by many Republicans in the United States. Donald Trump endorsed his reelection, and CPAC—that's the Conservative Political Action Conference—is planning to hold a three-day meeting in Hungary in May. The keynote speaker, Prime Minister Viktor Orban. To talk more about Orban and his reelection, we're joined by Ruth ben -Giet. She's the author of Strongmen, How They rise, why they succeed, how they fall. She's a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University and publishes Lucid, a newsletter on threats to democracy. Her recent piece for CNN was headlined, Orban's juggling act with Putin in Europe faces a key test. Talk about the significance of his reelection. Uh, was he hurt in any way by his support of Putin? Yeah, so Orban uh, played it very well. Uh, he said, we have to stay out of this war. This isn't in Hungary's interest. And he uh, notably, you know, poo-pooed the idea of any sanctions, uh, EU sanctions on Russian energy, but saying to Hungarian voters, well, this will drive up our prices. And so he posed as this protector of Hungarian interest and but many people, you know, they felt with with the war so close by, they wanted stability. And so he always manages to um, pose as this kind of stable protector figure. Now, what what swayed the election were two things, though, that um, he has developed the system called electoral autocracy, where he uses gerrymandering and he's captured the judiciary. And he has essentially developed a system over his 12 years in rule where it's very, very difficult for um, an opposition party to prevail. The system is kind of gamed from the outset. And the other factor, which is of interest to global politics and, and progressives everywhere, I think, is that um, he faced this unprecedented opposition. The, uh, they had six parties that banded together for the first time to try and unseat him. And that's been used in Chile in the 1980s, this kind of idea that everybody comes together. And it's worked in other places. But this coalition included Jobbik, which was a very far-right party, which joined the coalition and was becoming a little more centrist. And that part backfired, because Jobbik voters did not want to embrace a centrist coalition that included progressives. Because politics, after so many years of Orban, a demagogue, has become polarized. So those Jobbik voters defected to Orban's party or even to an extremist kind of neo-fascist Hungarian party. And so there's, it's like there's no center anymore. And so, so almost a million votes were lost in that way, and that further harmed the opposition. I wanted to go to Orban's chief rival, Peter Marquise, uh, campaigning, saying Hungary's future lies in the European Union and in NATO. But some voters seem swayed by Orban's claim that this could lead Hungary into war. This is a voter. Obviously, Russia and Ukraine had a lot to do with it. And Viktor Orban said that he would definitely not allow the Hungarian families to send their sons to the front line. So this was really an important factor. Professor Ben-Giet. 
Yeah, well, this is classic Orban, you know, uh, uh, kind of savvily saying, playing on fears of people, because it's, it's a very remote chance that Hungarians would have to uh, send people to war, even if they, uh, you know, were allies. But he plays on these fears. And th it's the same, this kind of ideology of, um, you know, Hungary, of, of protection that we have to be protected from George Soros, from, he made this victory speech and it was Brussels, you know, bureaucrats, he takes the EU's money, but they're a hostile force, that the world is stacked against Hungary and only I can protect you. It's like Hungary first, Hungary for Hungarians. And so that voter is expressing these fears that we have to stay out. But it, it, this, this attitude that he promotes is a kind of, it leads to more xenophobia, it leads to more paranoia, and that's exactly the kind of uh, attitude that right-wing politicians like him need in voters so that they can stay in power. Well, talking about xenophobia, I wanted to go back to last October, when Fox News host Tucker Carlson broadcast nightly from Budapest, I think it was for about a week, and interviewed the yeah. Hungarian Prime Minister Orban, who talked about his anti-immigrant policies. If somebody, without getting any per permission on behalf of the Hungarian state, cross your border, you have to defend your country and to say, guys, stop. And if you would like to cross or you would like to come, there's a legal procedure, we have to do it. But you can't cross, you know, uh, without any kind of limitation and permission and any contribution and control of the Hungarian state. It's dangerous. You have to defend your people against any danger. And you think you have a right to do that? Of course, that's got from the, it's coming from the God, the nature, so all arguments be, with us, because this is our country, this is our population, this is our history, this is our language, so we have to do that. So if you can talk, Professor ben -Giet, about uh, Orban as an icon for the right in the United States, that CPAC is going to have its conference there. Um, that's the Conservative Political Action Conference. And this is an interview with Tucker Carlson, where he was based for a few days in Hungary. For a whole week. And I've been, I've been tracking this. I've written about three essays for my newsletter on this. Mike Pence went there. Last year, Orban had a demographic summit. And, you know, Mike Pence chose, who's not the most uh, world, you know, worldly traveler, let's say, he chose to go there. And there he expressed his hope that we would no longer have abortion in the United States. And it was all about pro-family. And, and Tucker Carlson, it's quite extraordinary that he chose to broadcast for a whole week there. And, you know, he and other Republicans are very open about Hungary and electoral autocracy and Orban's idea of, quote, illiberal democracy, there's not much democratic in there, but it sounds good. It lets you keep EU funding. And this should be the future of America. And Tucker Carlson has said on his show, should we hold up Hungary as an example of what America should be in the future? And the answer for them is yes. And it's not just anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, these, these elections uh, on April 3rd, there was also a referendum to uh, further stoke anti-LGBTQ sentiment. And Orban has been one of the most aggressive <clears throat> in Europe at cracking, at repressing the rights of LGBTQ people. In 2018, he outlawed gender studies. In 2020, he ended legal recognition for trans, trans, uh, trans people and intersex people. And in 2021, he banned um, all television or other, um, you know, educational materials uh, showing, you know, educating about gender identity and sexual orientation. And you see how there's so many bills, hundreds of them now pending around the United States that are on the same key. And so there's a lot of ideological affinity between the GOP and Orban and what the GOP is fixing on now with gerrymandering, voter suppression is leading. They see somebody who's succeeded in what they want to do politically. Um Finally, if you could comment on what Orban means for Putin right now. I mean, you have um, 
Orban, the third longest serving uh, leader in Europe, behind Lukashenko, another Putin ally in Belarus, 28 years. Of course, Putin himself, between prime minister and president, something like 23 years. And then Orban. Uh, now he says he's going to buy gas in rubles. Uh, what does that mean? And also his relationship with the rest of the United States government. Yeah, Orban's very useful for Putin, and it's it's interesting that shortly before the war started, Orban's made a declaration that 2021 was the best ever year for Hungarian-Russian relations. And what Orban is able to do, and he's much more palatable, so Orban is the palatable, acceptable, between quotes, autocrat, like Lukashenko is not. Lukashenko is an upright <clears throat> and outright dictator and Putin puppet. And Orban, because he's in the EU, has this veneer of, you know, a little more independence. But for that reason, he's dangerous. And he's very much a, a conduit for uh, the infiltration and, and, you know, spread of Putin ideas in a more palatable frame. And that's also why the GOP and other, and Le Pen in France, they feel that even though, you know, Putin might be toxic, Orban is This weekend, is, Le Pen uh, running this weekend. That's right. And Orban seems more acceptable. We don't hear about people being poisoned or falling out of windows. And yet, uh, Orban's very tied to uh, Putin, and not just because of energy. So he is definitely one of these partners that Putin has long depended on. He had Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, he had Berlusconi in Italy, and now he has Orban.